Good evening. Welcome to welcome to gospel welcome to gospel nights. Tonight we're going to be covering Matthew chapter eleven. Last week we covered um, Matthew chapter ten. So before so before we go go in, we're going to open up in a time of prayer. Father God, I thank you for your word, Father. I thank you, Father, for, for, for your revealed word, which is life and which is truth, Father. And I pray, oh God, that you help me, Father, as I bring forth your word, Father. And I pray, Father, for those that are watching, Father, and those that are here, Father, that you open their eyes to see your truth, open their ears to hear your truth, and open their hearts to receive your truth, which is life. And I pray grace, mercy, and peace to be multiplied over everybody here and watching online. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so we're starting in Matthew chapter 11, and this, and we're going to start off with verses 1 through 5, where it says, Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The leopards are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So he's starting off, now it came to pass. This is coming off of, this is coming off of Matthew 10. And in Matthew 10, we remember from last week that, that Jesus took the disciples, he took the apostles, he appointed them, he appointed them to go forth two by two. So after he was finished with them, then it says when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. So this is showing that Jesus' appointment, Jesus' ministry wasn't just to the disciples, but it was to, to those that are lost. Whereas what was common in that culture is when a rabbi would take on a disciple, their focus would only be on the few disciples they have or if they have a school, the students that they have. They wouldn't go outside of the people that came to them because the, the rabbi did not pursue students. The students would pursue the rabbi. Whereas Jesus, he is pursuing those who will become his disciples. And then when he appoints them to go out, to go out, to go out in all, to, all through Israel to proclaim the gospel... He goes and looks for more. His goal and his mission is to reach the lost and not just the apostles. The appointment of the apostle is to maximize the usage of the gospel being preached. And this is something that is central even in today's church, to where a lot of times people, when they, when they look at the church, they think the pastor is the only one that is to preach the gospel, and all we're supposed to do is just stand idly in, in chairs and, and occupy pews. But the reality is, is the pastor has a purpose, but so do the people in the pews. There's a thing called priesthood of believers, and the priesthood of believers is a belief that the that the those that are those that are called laymen, meaning those who occupy the, the, the pews, they occupy the churches, their assignment is to reach people that the pastor otherwise wouldn't be able to reach. You look at your own lives, you have jobs, you have you have schools that you go to, you have family, that you those are opportunities for you to reach people with the gospel that the pastor wouldn't otherwise be able to. The, the goal of the pastor and the objective of the pastor, yes, is to feed the flock and administer the word of truth. But all those who are in Christ, they have the assignment to freely proclaim the gospel and their sphere of authority. But then in verse 2, Jesus said, and when, it, it says, And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his, of his disciples. So this is towards the end of John the Baptist's ministry. It starts off with, he was in prison. He was in prison. He heard about the works of Christ. It's interesting that it says that because in verse 1, it's saying Jesus went and was teaching. But then, it said, but then in verse 2, it's talking about the works of Christ. And the reason why it's talking about the works of Christ is because the teachings of Christ is always synonymous with miracles and healings. Because the miracles and healing is what validates his authority as the Christ. And, and John the Baptist being in prison, this is typifying our own imprisonment to sin before Christ. We are in prison, we are in bondage, but Christ came to deliver us. It is possible that John the Baptist, when he was in prison, this was a, te this was a testing time for him. It's possible that he doubted Jesus was the Messiah. Now we know earlier from the gospel that John the Baptist was saying, this is the one, this is the one who will come after me, whose, whose sandals I will not be able to tie. He is the one who will baptize you with fire. I baptize you with water, but his baptism will be greater. And I think a lot of times in our Christian walk, we start off really strong. 
We start off with a strong faith. I know that Jesus died for my sin, that if he died for my sin and rose from the grave, I know he'll get me through all of the circumstances that I go through in life. But then, but then when the storm comes, then we waver, we question, God, are you there for me? Are you going to get me through this? And so John the Baptist, he was a man like us. Yes, he was a great man of God. Yes, he was appointed with a great assignment. But even, even here you see doubts entering. But these doubts, these doubts did not result in him being condemned. Because, because when he sent the two disciples, when he sent two, ask him, Jesus gave a response. And the response was a condemnation. Which as we, can, as, as we continue the breakdown, you'll see that doubting God isn't always ground for condemnation. How you doubt or why you doubt is what determines whether you get condemned by God or not. If you doubt God, if you doubt God in a way to where you reject who he is, you reject that he is Lord, that is not doubt, that is unbelief. But if you're like, I know you are God. I know you're the son of God. I know you came to redeem me. But I don't understand what's going on in my life. I don't understand what, 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 what is going on at this moment, but I know that you're God. That is not the doubt that will cause you to, to, to be condemned by a holy God. So why did it say that he sent two of his disciples? So John the Baptist, he had three, but he said two. He sent two. Why did he send two? So two, so two disciples, this is a foreshadow of the new birth. It's a foreshadow of the new birth. It's the close of, of John the Baptist's ministry pointing to, the, pointing to Jesus bringing about the new birth, which is through regeneration. And then, and then Jesus responds. When, when the disciples came, he answered to them, go and tell John, John the things which you see, hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The leopards are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So the key part is it's not just what you hear, but what you see. There's a lot of people in the healing movement. They have all these fantastic testimonies purported that we see healings. We're seeing miracles, but there's no documentation of it. So it's just hearsay. Whereas Jesus, he's saying, go tell them the things you hear and see. Healing and, healing and miracles. Those are validations to the gospel. Signs and wonders follow the proclamation of the gospel. But it's documented healings and miracles that validate. Jesus didn't just say, you hear these things. No, he's saying, you hear and you see these things. And so in verse 5, it says, the blind see and the lame walk. The leopards are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. This, this, is, this is going back to a, to a prophecy that was given in Isaiah 35, 5, pertaining to the Messiah. Where it says, and the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. So the context of Isaiah 35, it deals with the coming of the Lord. Because in verse 2, it talks, about, it talks about the Lord dwelling with people. So then in verse, then in verse 6, it says, And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So what does it mean to be offended because of Christ? So offended in Greek is skandaliso, which means stumbling block. So a better way to understand this text, it'd be, and blessed is he who has not stumbled because of me. Blessed is he who has not stumbled because of me. So happy is he who is not made to stumble by Christ. What does that mean? That seems, that seems counterintuitive because Christ does not desire for us to stumble, but yet he's saying happy is he who has not stumbled by me. What we see in 1 Corinthians 1 23, it says, but we preach Christ crucified. This is Paul relay, relaying the gospel to the Corinthians. To the Jews, a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. So again, there, there's a, there, it, Christ is a stumbling block for some people. But Christ is not a stumbling block for the believers. He's a stumbling block for the unbelievers. Those who reject the gospel. Those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They are the ones that Christ to them is a stumbling block. But it says to the Jews a stumbling block, not to the Greeks, to the Greeks foolishness. Why is it foolishness to the Greeks? The message of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks because the Greeks, they were all into logic. They were all into reason. And the cross seems irreasonable. Man being totally depraved and deserving of death, the only remedy being God coming in the form of man, 
That doesn't make any sense to the Greeks. Well, it's foolishness. But to the Jew, it was a stumbling block. But why was, why was it hard for the Jews as a whole and as a people to accept Jesus as a Messiah? It's because they set up an unrealistic expectation of who the, of who the Messiah would be. They did not root who the Messiah would be in the scripture. They rooted who the Messiah would be through their man-made traditions. They viewed him in only one aspect of his ministry, but neglected the other aspect. They viewed, they viewed the Messiah as one who would overcome, one, one who would overthrow Rome and establish the kingdom of God. They viewed him as a king, which yes, he is our king. And yes, he will come to establish the kingdom of God and overthrow all the governments in his second coming. But the scripture also shows that he needed to come and die. And he had to come and he had to rise again. You see that in Isaiah 53. So the stumbling block is the expectation we have for the Messiah not rooted in who he revealed himself as. And I think a lot of times we, we come to Christ in the way that we want to, or we view Christ the way we want him to be. But it's not about what our opinion of who the Christ is, but it's about what scripture says Christ is. Who he is. He is the son of God. And he came to redeem fallen man. And if we don't recognize that, then we are believing in a false Christ. Then it goes on in verses 7 through 13, back in Matthew chapter 11, where it says, As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft, soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent taken by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So it starts off as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Again, this is talking about the expectations. What was the expectation of these people when they were coming to see John the Baptist in the wilderness, when he was preaching repentance? What was their expectation? He's saying, were you expecting a reed shaken by the wind? So what does it, what does it mean, what does it mean to, to be a reed shaken, a reed shaken by the wind? So shaken in Greek is salion, meaning to agitate. And wind in Greek is a, is a nomos, meaning agitation by wind. So there's two similar words that mean a similar thing, both agitation, but one gives an implication by force. So there's an agitation that's coming from a strong pressure. So shaken by wind implies a pressure by force. And the reed, and the reed is, talk, is talking about a little, a little piece of wood, it's a tiny piece of wood, and when the wind comes and when the pressure comes, the weed, the weed gets thrown all over the place. So Jesus is saying, wait, was that what you were expecting from, from John the Baptist? Were you expecting one that would be, that, that be hard-pressed press when pressure came? Somebody that would fold when pressure came? But they didn't get that. John the Baptist was not shaken. John the Baptist was one of the first martyrs for the Christian faith. When he went to prison, which, you, which as we go later in the Gospels, you'll, you, you'll see this. John the Baptist suffered death for his obedience to the law of God. His obedience to Christ cost him his life. John the Baptist was not one that was shaken. He was not shaken by pressure or by force. And then, and then it says, but what do you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So there were some that were coming to John the Baptist expecting him to be a king. They, they, they expected him to, to, have, to, have all the, to have all the luxuries of a king. But what do they see? They see a man that's eating locusts. And, and a man with poor clothing choices. It wasn't really fashionable. He was a caveman in the first century. But then there were some. Because in verse 9 he says, But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. 
So there were some who rightly saw him for who he was, being a prophet. And the significance about that as a prophet is one who represents God. He represents God. God has no need for the worldly apparels and the worldly kingdoms. He already has that. He already has all the possessions. So John the Baptist came as a servant. A prophet is to be a servant, not to be a king. For the prophet serves the people, foreshadowing Christ, the greatest prophet. We see, we see in Luke 3.15, where it says, Now the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. So there were some, when they, when, they, when they viewed him as a prophet, they thought him a little bit more. They wondered, if, is he the Christ? Is he the Messiah that was promised? That evidence, there were some people who viewed him as a prophet, but they viewed him a little bit more. But Jesus said, I say to you, and more than a prophet, what does that mean? Well, in verse 10, he clarifies, for this is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. This is a quotation out of Isaiah 43. So what does it mean for, for, for John the Baptist to prepare, to prepare the way for Christ? So John the Baptist, he prepared the way for Jesus by preaching repentance. All right, so there was Jews that were coming, they were coming to be baptized. But their baptism was a sign of works. It was, a, it was to them a demonstration of their holiness. But John the Baptist was saying to be made ready for the Christ. Your works won't save you because you're sinful. You need to repent of your sins. Repentance is, a, repentance is a unifying bond between us and the death and burial of Christ. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is on the merit of repentance, and that's not work-based doctrine because it's, great, because it's a grace. It's a grace of God that enables us to repent. And John the Baptist, he preached repentance to change the view the Jews had pertaining the Messiah. Because their expectation was a political ruler will come to overthrow the Roman government. But John the Baptist is demonstrating the, that the first, his, his first assignment is to conquer our hearts. And then what does it mean for him to be more than a prophet? Does that mean, does that mean there's different classes of prophets? There's some that will suggest that, that there's different levels of prophets. But that's not what this text is saying. What this text is saying, what it's talking about more than a prophet, is speaking of his primacy over other prophets. Because John the Baptist, he was the last prophet of the Old Covenant. So a lot of people think the New Covenant started in the Gospels. But the New Covenant started at the end of the Gospels. Because the New Covenant wasn't initiated until Christ died. That was when the new covenant initi was initiated. So John the Baptist was a prophet under the old covenant. He was the last prophet under the old covenant. Then it talks about the least, the least in the kingdom, that they will be greater than John the Baptist. We'll see John the Baptist as a great, great prophet, the greatest prophet under the old covenant. But then the least in the kingdom are greater than John the Baptist. How can that be so? It's because John the Baptist, he represents the transition into the new covenant. But we live in the new covenant, which is a better covenant. So the babe in Christ under the new covenant is counted as greater than John the Baptist because we, to us was given the fullness of the revelation of God. Then it, talk, then it talks about the kingdom suffering violence. So there's a lot of people from the dominion theology camp that believe that this is talking about mandation of, of taking dominion of culture, taking dominion of society. Because of the kingdom of God suffers violence. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. There's different interpretations of how this text is. Some say, some say that this is talking about persecution, that the kingdom of heaven is suffering persecution. Because when you look in the Gospels, everywhere Jesus went, he was being persecuted. Everywhere he went. But the problem with that interpretation is that it, is that it follows with the violence taken by force. So if, those, so if the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, then that means that, the, oppressor, that the, the oppressors are taking the kingdom by force. So that can't be what that's saying. So then what does it mean for the kingdom of heaven to suffer violence? This means that this speaks of the triumph of the gospel. That when the gospel is preached, the gospel, the gospel accomplishes what it purposed, and the gospel purposes to reach the lost. And so what is speaking of the violence, it speaks of the believers who proclaim the gospel. So we are, we are violent in our preaching, not in, the, not in the physical sense, not in the dominion sense, but we, are, but we are zealous to reach the lost. 
And the violence that's talked about for the gospel is not one that's talking about overthrowing people. We're definitely not, we're definitely not like the Muslims. But what this is referring to is that, is, that our, is that our love and our desire and our yearning to reach the lost overcomes the hearts of those that are in, that are in bondage. The gospel message has power to save people. So when it's speaking of the violent, it's saying that the gospel message has the power to captivate your heart by force. And what that means is it takes people that are previously unwilling and makes them willing. It's not that you're taking, it's not that you're taking dragging. You were made willing and therefore you want to respond in, in faith and repentance. So it's a loving response. God changes your nature. God doesn't need your say so to save you. If he has called you, if he has predestined you, then you will come. Because that's how much he loves you. His love extends so much that he has found a way to secure your salvation. Because if our salvation was rooted in our free, free choice, then what confidence do we have? What hope do we have? Adam had free choice and he fell the first opportunity he had. If we put our faith and stock in our free choice, then we are doomed. But our faith and trust and our confidence is rooted in God's infinite love and his infinite wisdom. That whom he predestined, he will preserve and he will keep until the day of judgment. And to us, it will not be a day of judgment, but it will be a day of redemption. And so when we see, so when we see the, 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 um, the suffering of violence and, and the violent taking the, taking the kingdom by force, meaning we move forward the kingdom, we advance the kingdom, persecutions doesn't, doesn't hinder us. Persecutions help us. Part of the problem with the American church is we're not persecuted. And that the, the way that the kingdom is suppressed is when the church becomes part of the state. The church represents a separate kingdom in the kingdom of the world. So the, domin so the dominion that we do take, because there is a dominion, but the dominion that we take, it's more of a spiritual dominion. It's a dominion where we desire to demonstrate the love of God in all areas of our life. We desire for the gospel to be preached in every aspect of our life to every person that is in our life. We desire for them to know Christ. Not that, we, not that we go into government and then make laws based off of Christian laws, or we go into, or we go into industries and make them Christian, or we Christianize the nations. That's not the core of the gospel. Because the core of the gospel is spiritual-based. It's rooted in redeeming fallen man. Not in, not in, not in granting fallen man, the, desi the, the, desi the carnal desires of the flesh. Because it sounds like a good thing to Christianize the nation, but all it does is fulfill a carnal desire. We should not desire the things of the world, but we should desire the things of the world to come. That is why we have an earnest hope and an expectation. If we realize it in this life, then what is there to hope for? But then, but then in verse 13, it says, For all the prophets in the law prophesied, until John. So this, so this is talking about we are, that we are seeing the violent take the kingdom by force. What this is referring to is the prophets before they only prophesied of the church. They only prophesied of the triumph of the gospel. Whereas we witness the fulfillment of what they prophesied. We are, we are, we are the violent, not in a violent sense, but that, but that the gospel triumphs. The gospel is an effectual message. It's not a message that can be refused. If the gospel is refused, it is because it is because you are not predestined by God. And then in verse 14, going, going back again to Matthew chapter 11, it says that if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. So John the Baptist wasn't just viewed as a messenger, but he was viewed as Elijah. Right, Malachi 4, 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, there, so, there, so it says Elijah the prophet will come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So he needed to come before Jesus' first coming, and he also come before Jesus' second coming. Some people will take this to then say, say this is proof of reincarnation, but that's not what this text is saying. So when this is talking about that, that John the Baptist is Elijah who is to come, this speaking became in the spirit of Elijah. And what that means to come in the spirit of Elijah means that he operated in a similar function as Elijah did. 
Not that, not that Elijah's spirit was on John the Baptist, but that, Eli, but that John the Baptist operated in a similar manner as Elijah. So when you, look, when you look at Elijah's ministry, Elijah was one of the last prophets. He was one of the last prophets, and he was the one to stand for the people of God. He was the one who would, he was, he was even persecuted for his stance for, for, for the word of God. He was the one that would bring reformation, in a sense, to Israel because he gathered the, the remnant of the prophets and, and said, we must, we must return back to true worship. We can't, we can't settle for Baal worship. Being, being, in, being in Israel, he was the one to challenge the false prophets of Baal. He was the one to challenge the wicked queen Jezebel. So John the Baptist, here also being one of the remnant, one of the remnant of the, of the prophets, one of the remnant of the true people of God was one who sought reformation for Israel and situating their hearts on repentance and not situating their hearts on their good works and their good deeds. We then see in Matthew chapter 11, verse 15 through 19, where it says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I like in this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lamb it. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. So first it's talking about he who has ears, let him hear. That doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that there's people without ears, their ears are chopped off. What it's saying, he who has ears, speaking of the elect. Because the thing of the word of God, the word of God can only be comprehended by those whom the Holy Spirit has revealed it to. So the ears to hear speaks of the elect. Only those who are predestined and called can understand the word of God. So he's talking to the elect when he's saying this. But then he says, but to what shall I like in this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions. You, and you did not lamb it. So in this time period, there was a common child's game. To where what they would do, where what they would do is they would go and they would play and they would play the they would play the flute and then they they would add, they, they would act a performance out that that was that was similar to what the normal function would be and it was a, you know it was a game for it was a game for them and so when he's saying this he's saying I like in this generation the children are playing in the marketplace but they're not doing their part they're not playing the game they're not participating in the game. It's like it's like if you play pool. If you, it's like you play pool with a basketball. You're trying to shoot the basketball in the hole. The basketball is too big to go into the hole. You're not you're not playing the game appropriately. So what does he mean by this? He means that that the kingdom of God is here right now. It is here right now, and you are not participating in God's plan for redemption. So he's using this to show the Jews that the Jews that that they are wicked in their works. That they, that they are not participating in God's plan for redemption, but they're actually opposing it. This is evident by accrediting demons to John the Baptist's ministry and even Jesus' ministry. And there's a lot of people, when they preach the gospel, they, they're, told, they're told they're not operating in the Holy Spirit. But they're, operate, but they're operating by demons. There's some people who are preaching the gospel, and they're called heretics. They're called wolves. For the sake of the gospel. But we should rejoice. Because John the Baptist and Jesus were both, were both called heretics. They were both counted as demon possessed. So we should take joy. But then, but then it says, but wisdom is justified by her children. So what does that mean? Wisdom is justified by her children. So wisdom is referred in the feminine sense as by her children. This reflected for Proverbs. When you read through Proverbs, it talks about wisdom as in a feminine sense. So different commentators have different interpretations of wisdom. Some say it can reflect Christ. Some say it can reflect the Holy Spirit. I'm of the belief that, that, with, that wisdom is reflected best in, with the Holy Spirit. Because when you look at Jesus and the church, the, Jesus is referred to as a bridegroom, and the church is, reviewed at, is, is viewed as a bride. We are made the bride. Through the work of the Holy Spirit. So wisdom is best typified in the feminine, in the feminine sense. But it says the wisdom is justified by her children. So what does this mean? The way that we live our lives and the, and the attitudes that we have in, in carrying this word of truth. 
evidences our relationship with God. If we accredit a ministry or a people as a work of demons, when they are walking in truth and integrity, all that, all that does is shows that you're not a child of God. But those, who, those in the times of opposition, in the, time, in the times of trials and tribulations, that stand firm on the word of truth, they demonstrate themselves as children of God. So wisdom is demonstrated by the elect's acceptance of Jesus' messiahship. Those who accept Jesus as Lord, as Son of God, those are the wise ones. Those who reject, they all they demonstrated that they were children of Satan. Then in Matthew 11, 20 through 24, it says, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For in for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon and the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and the day of judgment than for you. So first he begins, then he began to rebuke the city in which most of his mighty works have been done. So this shows that miracles were a common thing in Jesus' ministry. Now there's a lot of people who think that the reason Jesus did all these miracles was as a pattern for us. But that was not the purpose of it. Because you see that he rebuked them. Why? Because they did not repent. So the miracles were to bring people to repentance. I know that's a bad word in a lot of churches now. Repentance is what God calls us to. If you have a gospel without repentance, then you have a false gospel. And if you came to Christ under a gospel that did not encompass repent of your sins, then you are not saved. The miracles were to demonstrate who he was as the Messiah, and these miracles were to draw people to repentance. But they weren't drawn to repentance. They enjoyed the healings that Jesus brought. They enjoyed the miracles. That he freed, they freed them from the, from the afflictions that they have. But they didn't repent. And how many times are, are Christians like this? To where they want the benefits of the covenant. They want, they want the blessings that come with following God. But they don't want to repent. So Jesus said to these people, and can say, we'll say also to those, to those Christians... They just look God, look at God as somebody who just blessed them unconditionally. There's nothing they have to do. He said, but I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Sodom was a pretty wicked place. And then, and then the woes, the woes. He said, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon. They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. What does it mean to repent in sackcloth and ashes? Sackcloth and ashes dealt with mourning. So when if Jesus is saying, if I did these works there, that they would mourn over their sins. They would mourn on their imminent doom because they would recognize that they are doomed before a holy God. So why does he use Tyre and Sidon and Sodom? Tyre and, Tyre and Sidon and Sodom were used because they were the most wicked of cities in the Old Testament. This was to show the extent of wickedness in this generation. So, so these cities, they, they embody fallen man, the sinfulness of man. And God did not spare the cities of old to demonstrate the cost of rebellion. Because then some will take this, they're like, why didn't Jesus then come to spare Tyre and Sidon and Sodom if they would have repented? So a lot of times, people are people in their life. They're like, God, I don't understand why you're not moving in my life. I don't understand why you're not taking me out of this hardship. You know, your, your word says that you promised deliverance. Yes, he does. But he cares more about your soul. He cares more about your soul than he does about your flesh. Quite, Jesus, Jesus and Paul are exhort us to die to the flesh, deny the flesh. The reason why sometimes we have periods where it seems like we're stuck and God just isn't delivering us. It's because God is teaching us the cost of sin. Yes, God is a forgiving God. He forgives us of our sins, but there's also earthly consequences to sin. 
And if God delivered us from every, from, if he delivered, delivered us from every sin that we commit, then we would see no purpose for not sinning. So he has us in positions where we're stuck sometimes to refine us, to teach us the cost of sin, to teach us to hate sin, and to teach us to not sin. I know that's a hard message to receive, but Jesus came to die for you. He didn't, he didn't just come to die, but he came to redeem you. He came to redeem you and restore you back into the relationship with God. God is a holy God. He has come to conform you to the image of his son. If God delivered you from everything immediately, then there would be no room for you to grow because growth first starts with a hatred for sin. You have to hate sin. You have to hate evil. Because if you don't hate evil, then you won't love the good. But sometimes we don't know. We can't hate evil until we see the consequence of evil and the destruction of sin. But then it talks about a you, Capernaum, you who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So what does it mean for Capernaum to be exalted to heaven? So Jesus here is saying they were exalted to heaven because Jesus was present in it. So a departure then from that town sends the city to hell. You look at it, you look at it even in the you look at it even in the church and even in the unconverted life. Before you came to Christ. There's grace that is given, even to, the, even to the unregenerate. There's a common grace. The Bible says that rain goes on the just and the unjust. That's referred to as common grace. So God is at work even in the hearts of the unregenerate in a general sense. Now for the elect, he, in the elect, he works in a special way to where he redeems you or restores you back into fellowship. But for the unregenerate, there's a common grace that is given. Why? Because God is present in this life. He's present everywhere. He's, he's, on, he's on the present. Wherever God, wherever God is, there's grace. There's grace given at different degrees. But the departure of Jesus then sends you to hell. So when you are not, so when you are not yet, when you're not regenerated, you're separated from the presence of God. And if you're separated, the only destination that you have is hell. And that's why there's a call to repent of our sins and come unto life. Which we then see in Matthew eleven twenty five 25 through, through, through 30, as we close. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he's first saying, saying, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. So the further evidence, those who are not predestined, those who are not called, the things of the kingdom of God, they're hidden from them. Why is it hidden? It's a display of judgment on sin. But it's revealed. It's revealed unto babes. So the wise and the prudent, these are the ones who exalt themselves. These are the great ones in the world. But those that are babes, those are the least in the world. Those are the outcasts. Those are the downcasts. God came. God came for the lowly. He came for the lowly so that he could be their strength. He came for the lowly to demonstrate his loving kindness, to demonstrate that those of the world rejects, he accepts. God is countercultural. What well, the culture decrees the scripture decrees contrary because the world is in opposition with God. What, what, the, what the worldly mind sets on, the spiritual mind condemns. And what the spiritual mind approves of, the carnal mind detests. But this is also to show revelation of Christ that comes from God only. Then it speaks of those, then it, then it speaks of those who labor and are heavy laden. So what does it mean that we labor and are heavy laden? This is speaking of our former conduct before Christ. Those that labor and are heavy laden speaks of those in their sins. Our sins have weakened us. Our sins have weakened our conscience. It has made us moral deficit. It has given us a moral deficit and has made, and has, and has made God's love incomprehensible for us unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. Unless the Holy Spirit reveals that Jesus is a Christ and reveals our sinfulness, then, then we, view, we view good as evil and evil as good. But, but for those who labor and are heavy laden, 
upon revelation of the depravity of man and our own depravity, they are offered rest. He says, come to me, all you, who, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the foreshadow of the gospel. He's saying he's come to give us rest, and the rest that he desires to give us is rest from our wicked works. So Jesus died for our sins and redeemed us. So when we are restored under right relationship with God, we rest from our sinful conduct. We are delivered from our sins. Meaning that we're no longer in bondage to sin, but we're now in bondage to do righteousness. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So when he's speaking of his yoke, he's talking about the requirements. He's talking about the requirements of following him. But he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the Pharisees, they had, they, had all, they had the 613 laws. They had a bunch of traditions on how to follow those 613 laws. So it was above 613 laws. It was a very, it was a very hard yoke, and it was very heavy. But Jesus, he's saying his yoke is easy and his burden light. Does that mean that he nullified the law? No, for he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill it. What this means is that, is that he has alleviated he has alleviated the yoke. He has alleviated the pressure on us of obeying the law of God. It is no longer by our own power that we follow the, follow the law of God, speaking of the moral law. But it's by the Holy Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit that works and operates in us. So the requirement that he has to lean on the Spirit, to lean on the Spirit, not just what the Scripture reveals, but on the revelation the Holy Spirit has given. The Holy Spirit has redeemed us and has given us the capacity to love the Lord with all of our heart and to follow Him. And so I close with this, that if there's anybody who feels heavy laden, if there's anybody that feels like they, they, have a, they have a heavy yoke because of their sins, there's a call, there's a call to salvation, and that call of salvation is Jesus died for your sins. He died so He could take your yoke, so he can take it, take it on to himself. He bore your sins and my sins on the cross to give us a pathway to salvation. So if there's anybody that's watching that, that feels like they need to come to that place of rest, it's okay if you feel like you've been in church for a while and you have not yet heard this message of the cross. God does not cast away anybody who comes to him with tears and sorrow. He does not come to a he does not, he does not, he does not cast away somebody who has a broken heart. Those are a broken and contrite heart is what pleases God. Because that's a heart that God can operate in. So I'd like to close this in prayer. Father God, I thank you, Father, for your word, Father. And I thank you, O oh God, for your son, Father. I thank you, O oh God, that you sent your son to take our place on the cross, Father. To die, to die on our behalf, take on our death, and to bear the fullness of your wrath on that cross, Father. That those who put their faith and trust in you have a grand escape from the day of judgment. That for us, it'll be a day of redemption. I pray for everybody that, that is here and anybody that's watching online, Father. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you soften their hearts, Father, to receive your word and receive your truth and that you draw them onto repentance father they may find salvation for their souls and i pray grace mercy and peace be multiplied in the name of jesus i pray amen